there with me. Everyone is welcome. And uh, at the, the committee, it's, it's not a heavy agenda to, today, uh, but still there are important items to discuss from the, the, the police and the fire and rescue service. Um, in terms of, we just go initially through the, the items on the, the agenda. So there's no... C convener, before we start, can I read out a little bit of spiel and just do a roll call to make sure yes, that we absolutely. have the correct yes, members here? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, good morning to convener, vice convener and all the members. Just a reminder that this session of the meeting is recorded and will be published online for public access as soon as we can after the meeting. Um, accordingly, can all attendees switch off their camera and mute their microphones when not speaking? Uh, I'll assist some of the technical issues that we sometimes get. Um, guidance is available on how to do this and how to switch on and off is required. If you're required to speak, please select the waving the raise the hand symbol is available in the more options area. Anything else, if there's a technical issue, please just call out and myself or the convener will get you as soon as we can. Um, if I can just start with a roll call, please, to make sure that everybody's here. Uh, convener Councillor Stewart, I've already discussed with yourself, so I, I can see you, I know you're here. Um, Vice Convener Councillor Dunbar. Good morning, Derek and everyone. Good morning. Councillor Allard. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Councillor Duncan. Yes, good morning, everybody. Councillor Greg. Here. Councillor Houghton. Morning, everyone. Hello. Councillor McGregor. Morning. I'm here. C Councillor Townsend. Morning. I'm here. Morning. Councillor Fielder has tendered apologies and has replaced a substitute with Councillor Mason, who is having sound difficulties, but we can see you. Councillor Mason, if you wish to interact in the meeting, I would suggest you may want to use the chat area. Uh, and we will see your chat and we can pick it up from there. Um, we have Mr Bell, the executive lead of the committee. Good morning. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. And we also have Chief Superintendent McDonald from Police Scotland. Good morning, everyone. And Area Commander, Mr Farquharson. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Convener. It's your roll call complete and all the issues dealt with. Okay. Thank you, thank you, uh, Derek. That's very helpful. And welcome, Councillor Mason, for taking part in today's Public Protection Committee. Everyone is welcome and look forward to um, the various interactions. Now, I already see there is a hand up. I'm not sure who that is. Um, Derek, can you assist, It's please? Andrew Morrison. Um, thank you, Vina. Just to say that I'm present as well for, for the item on protective services. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. My apologies, Convener. Yes, we, we do have uh, authors present as well. We also have Councillor Cameron, who's observing uh, today as per the communication. OK, thank you very much. Right, if we're ready to go with that, um, then so in terms of the papers, and I will be, I'm turning to the side because I'm also working from a hard copy of papers, just so you, you uh, know and understand that. So there is no urgent business. Uh, there is no exempt business at this time. Um, I will ask, are there any declarations of interest? I don't believe there to be any. Um, there's no deputations. The minute of the previous meeting, which was the 2nd of December, and thankfully we're now into spring. Um, are you happy? I, I see one hand up. I'm not sure where it is. Um, Councillor, Alard, do you have a, a question or a comment re regarding the uh, minute? Uh, yes, uh, it's about, thank you very much, Convener. It's about uh, on page um, on page 11 and 12. It's regarding uh, the Convener advice, uh, where was I? Uh, it's about uh, an update on our preparedness to EU exit arrangement. And I note that we did receive an update by email, uh, which says uh, that it was difficult to give members uh, a full answer because, of course, uh, the, um, 
the 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 deal had not been done yet, and the relationship and between the EU and Brexit and the UK had not uh, been established yet. So I just wanted to know if we were better advanced now than the email that we have received, and if we receive uh, uh, a following update uh, later on to see uh, if we how this preparedness. Uh, has been uh, established, is it adequate, and uh, if we are encountered any problems yet. Th thank you, Councillor Allard. Um, Mr Bell, are you able to address that? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, that's right. I, I, I circulated a note just before um, New Year's Eve, uh, just to say that it was still a little bit too tricky because we hadn't arrived at a deal uh, at that point. What I can say now is that um, the risks that we identified um, leading up to uh, the, the deal being achieved, um, none of them have become issues to, to the organisation. Um, so we're still monitoring the situation on a daily basis. Uh, all partners are reporting into a central system on a national basis. Uh, and we're getting the reports back on a, a, a daily basis. Uh, and monitoring those to consider what impacts there could be on the, the City Council, or indeed the, the, the place of Aberdeen. Um, but in response to Councillor Allard's um, question, um, none of the risks have uh, become issues, but we'll continue to monitor the, the, the situation and monitor um, for any legislative change uh, on the back of the, the new relationship that we've got with the uh, EU. Should anything become an issue, then obviously we would um, escalate that accordingly to, to, to address the matter. Um, but as it stands at the moment, there's there's nothing um, causing too much concern for us at the moment. OK, thank you very much for that. Councillor Allard, does that answer your question? Yes, uh, thank you very much for this comprehensive answer. And I know it's difficult because the things are, keep on going. Uh, I just to make sure that we get uh, regular updates uh, will be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as just as a, a slight aside from the minute, Derek, can I ask you, is that actually on the business planner that we would maybe have an update on this situation um, in April again? Uh, the update isn't there. The, it was the update that Mr Bell previously circulated. We shall append an item to the um, business planner for future reporting. Mr Bell may have a better timeline to consider when that would be best. Okay. It, it was just to suggest, uh, convener, perhaps I could, um, like I did in December, uh, just provide another service update uh, to the, the, the committee um, next month, and um, that'll be about four months after my last one, um, just to give you a, an update on whether or not there are uh, any risks that have become issues to the organisation. Um, well, we could have a service update, but I'm just wondering whether it should actually, is this could be a rolling item, um, because we don't know how, no one can predict how things might be. I um, mean, is that something that should actually be on the planner rather than just a service update? I'm looking for a bit of advice here, but trying to be helpful at the same time, because for instance, if it comes up again, you know, like will Councillor Allard or another councillor ask a similar question the next time round. That's why I'm asking is it would be more prudent to put it on the business planner? We we could certainly uh, put it on the business planner and it wouldn't be too difficult to to, to bring something to a committee. Um, and it might just simply be a, a note and report um, just with an update on the, 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 the situation. I, I, that would be my preference to, yeah. to do that, at least for the foreseeable future, maybe for the covering the next um, two meetings, which would be April and I think the end of June or, or, or thereabouts, and then we can uh, review the situation after that. OK, thank you. Okay, thank you much. Was there anything else on the minute? Any other members wanting to ask anything? I'm not seeing any hands, so if uh, you're happy to approve the minute as it stands. So I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> There's yes, some... convener. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Duncan. Thank you. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. So there are. We're on to the committee planner. So, um, Derek, happy for you to take us through the planner as it stands. 
but I know that there are some other items that other members would now like to add onto the planner. And I know that you have some sitting with you as well. So if you Thank can you. Yeah. do that, please. Thank you, convener. My apologies, my camera has failed, so I'll be in audio as opposed to yeah. video. Which is maybe better for everybody, if I'm being honest. Not at all. But I'm glad to see you're looking well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, the, indeed, the, the committee has before it the business planner. Um, it has been updated to reflect today's business, which is slightly lighter than normal, but it also identifies, if I can attract you to a line number six, which is the police complaints thematic, which will go to our next meeting on the 28th of April and also at line nine, which is the appropriate adults update um, due to operational response to the ongoing pandemic. This report has also been delayed until the next meeting on April. Um, members will notice by looking here that uh, the April agenda has got a lot more business in it. And I would also like to advise members that on behalf of the convener, I did circulate an email to all members seeking that, those further updates in respect of suggestions for Police Scotland and Scottish Fire and Rescue Service update. Um, is that sufficient convener or would you like me to go further? Uh well, I, I have two hands up, so yeah, um, I can I'll see them. Thank you. Ask if, if Councillor um, Townsend first, and then Councillor uh, Duncan to to come in. Um, I'm, I'm sure they have some suggestions, and I have a couple of my own as well. So, Councillor Townsend, nice to see you. Yes, thank you, Convener, and I appreciate the email from uh, Mr. Jameson to give us plenty uh, advance warning. I made five suggestions for both the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and Police Scotland. I'd like to focus on one specifically uh, with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, uh, and that's community engagement. I've read in previous reports that their community engagement throughout the pandemic has been stepped up and has been very, very successful. And I just wondered uh, if we could have a thematic on whether, uh, as we move out the pandemic and in future years, that they may consider uh, stepping up or keeping up the community engagement, engaging with age, disability, uh, drugs, alcohol, etc. But specifically, uh, young fire officers could show, uh, be role models if, in, for their fitness mm -hmm. and professionalism mm -hmm. in visiting schools, colleges, universities, etc. Because their capabilities go far beyond what's ever been before with all the expertise. I thought that would be a tremendous uh, one to go forward with. Did I carry on the Police Scotland one? Indeed? Yes, by all means. Uh, Police Scotland, uh, I notice in the, the planner that I previously suggested a thematic on a court death or sudden infant death and offshore deaths. Now, when I see it typed, it maybe looks a bit uh, jars. That why would you suggest those two? They don't specifically relate, but uh, offshore deaths uh, is very much a Northeast Division responsibility and it's a very complex. Uh, environment out there and as we go into decommissioning I thought it would be very uh, appropriate to focus on that because there'll be higher risks and in relation to court death or sudden infant death that is very personal to me for having been a, an investigating officer some decades ago that had a big effect on me and I wondered if the approach for officers uh, and the support that is mentioned in uh, other documents by the police is, is, is an increase for officers dealing with such uh, events because it's quite traumatic not only for parents but also uh, for the inquiry officers. And if I could just finish by saying I've suggested uh, five other uh, potential reports for Police Scotland, but the specific one that I'd like to focus on briefly just now is cybercrime. Uh, I, I notice in agenda item nine that uh, it's focused on a, a great increase in fraud online and non-direct fraud and also on page 34 it mentions online abuse uh, so i wondered if we could have a focus on cyber crime the prevalence thereof and i'm interested in the mobile telephone notebook uh, facility the officers carry that would direct initial inquiries for them which can be quite complex how it's allocated to a specialist and finally evidence storage which was formerly with europol but i wondered where we are at post-Brexit with that. And that's me, Premier, thank you. 
Um, thank you, Councillor Townsend. I think those are all very good um, suggestions um, that we can have as thematic reports. I'm not sure how what the time frame will be to have them and whether any of them would be able to come to the, the April committee, but I, I would like to see them on the, the definitely on the, the business planner. So I'm happy to accept that. I, I, th I think it is a very sensitive issue yeah. regarding um, caught death uh, for particularly. I didn't experience it, but I, I remember when I knew someone who did, and um, I, I'm sure the impact must be absolutely awful on the, the, the attending officer um, for that. So happy to accept it was uh, Councillor Duncan. Thank you, convener. Um, I've got uh, three suggestions for fire and rescue service thematic reports. One of them, I think, would dovetail in nicely with the suggestion that Councillor Townsend's made about a report on community engagement. I was focusing on the work that is being done with young people and communities to stop willful fire raising. Um, as you all know, I have a particular interest in that because the Gramps is in my ward. And a couple of summers ago, we did have quite a lot of incidents there where the, um, the perpetrator was actually caught and arrested, but it was a huge operation. And I know that lots of work has been done in schools in the past. Um, so it'd be interesting to have an update on the work that the service is doing on that aspect now. Um, I'm also interested to find out what proactive work is being done to reduce um, false alarms. There's, a, there's always a line in the uh, performance report and the figures are kind of fluctuating, but mostly going down and it would be really good to understand the background to all of that. And finally, a report on the rescue services as opposed to the fire services that are provided. I think we automatically gravitate towards fire issues when we speak about SFRS, but I suspect in terms of workload, rescue is probably taking up a larger part of that now because of the reduction in dwelling fires in particular. So they're just three of my suggestions for reports. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. I'm sure that we could uh, link in the two with the first one with Councillor Townsend. I'm sure that's fine. I see. Uh, so thank you for those uh, very positive and constructive uh, suggestions for the thematic reports. Derek, I see your hand up. Um, would you like to say something? Yes, thank you, convener. It was just to advise yourself and members that, that the intention, if I can suggest it, would be that all these good suggestions that are coming forward um, with our regular meetings that we have with Police Scotland and Scottish Fire and Rescue, we could plan that into the business planner for the coming year, coming cycle, so that we ensure there's an appropriateness of reports coming to each of the committees, convener. Yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be helpful, but we would want to spread them. Um, the only other one that what I had thought about um, is, as well in terms of the, the fire and rescue service is whether it's possible to have a, a, a report in terms of the impact on the mental health of um, fire officers in, and relating that to the COVID experience as well, where they're faced with that. Um, we've also got Councillor Duncan. Uh, oh no. Councillor so, Dunbar. Um, so I can see Councillor Dunbar. Um, would you like to come in, Councillor Dunbar? Hello. Um, yeah, it was just to say we did have a, um, I think, a short discussion at pre agenda um, about recruitment. Um, Councillor Townsend touched on it there with regard to um, community, edu um, community engagement. Um, and I think it, I mean, it might be useful whether, the, you know, recruitment itself, um, not only through the focus of community engagement, but the kind of wider issues around, you know, any challenges that services are facing. I know that there's, you know, a range of challenges locally around, um, you know, recruiting. Well, thank you for that helpful suggestion. I think, as Derek says, that these can all be collated and worked out on, on the, the the planner and we can liaise with Derek to see how they can be placed over the, the next coming year. Thank you, Kinvin. Thank you. Was that you finished taking us through the, the planner? I'm happy to incorporate those um, suggestions from the members of the committee. Thank you, Kinvin. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> Right, 
So we've no, as the committee planner, um, we have no notices of motion or referrals from <clears throat> council committees and subcommittees. So we are actually on to the police and fire rescue service section. But the first we have is the Police Scotland performance reports, April to September 2020. And it's pages 17 to 42. And uh, is the, I can't quite see, is the chief superintendent um, with us? I can't quite see. Good morning. Convener, how are you? I'm well, thank you. And you look well, so that's good. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. Good to see you, Convener. Thanks. So you just Yeah, absolutely. With, with your concurrence, Convener, um, I was probably going to take item uh, 11 in terms of the verbal update about COVID, just to give a little bit of chronology in terms of give the here and now and then move on to the performance report, if that's uh, uh, in order. Yes, and I, that's what I thought we were doing, actually. So yeah, yes, I think it makes sense to place everything um, in uh, the context of how we're living now. So yes, please do do that. Perfect. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'll, I'll run through some key points in relation to the, uh, in essence, the here and now, as is touched upon by the convener, and also the, I'll then segue on to the uh, performance report. Uh, quite incredibly, I think for all of us, it's fast approaching one year uh, that we've been subject to the, the, the challenges of the, the pandemic. Uh, it's been well commented on, well written upon, so I, I won't dwell on that. Uh, in terms of crime trends, um, little has really changed since my, my, my last update. Uh, for the first five to six weeks of the pandemic, we saw significant uh, reductions in relation to calls for service and reporting of crime. And since about May 2020, uh, that's very much stabilised and gone back to what we would uh, con consider to be business as usual to an extent. Overall, however, uh, actually reported crime still remains circa 10% down on what it was uh, last year to date, and that's been consistent throughout. And uh, incidents uh, fluctuate from uh, being normal for periods of time, but overall, Again, a 10 to 15 percent reduction uh, in uh, calls for service in relation to the public uh, reporting issues to us, depending on where we are, I suppose, at the material time in terms of the, the pandemic. Um, locally, uh, as I've touched upon and I've updated the committee previously, and I've certainly made point of, uh, of covering this in terms of correspondence to elected members and also uh, in the press, the, the attitude and support of the vast, vast majority of the public throughout Aberdeen City has been exemplary. It's been first class uh, and people have really just done their bit and done as much as they possibly can to support the, the, the greater public health uh, response, which has been uh, very much appreciative. Um, the impact this will have, as I've touched upon in Crime Trends, will remain with us for quite some time, members. Um, it, you know, currently, we've got five years of baseline information and we can reflect last year to date versus this year to date. But as the uh, as the pandemic uh, you know, hopefully uh, moves towards a more stable position and we get closer to normality, whatever that might be uh, in the coming months, the impact it will have on reported crime and trends um, will be significant and will impact in terms of our reliance on some of that data uh, in years to come. Perhaps not right now, perhaps not in the next 12 to 24 months, but certainly at some point in the future, probably two to three years time, it will skew the uh, performance data quite significantly. I'll touch upon hidden harm because again, I think there's real worries about potential hidden harm that will emerge as we come out of the pandemic and significant increases in reporting of elements of that. So I'll come back to that at some point. Um, in terms of the compliance, uh, as I say, very, very high compliance within the city and the attitude of the public has been you know, exemplary. Uh, small, small incidents, I would just if you consider the population of the city and what we're actually dealing with. We have had challenges uh, recently, in particular uh, late January and late February, uh, probably the most challenging period we've had in relation to uh, areas of non-compliance. Uh, particularly, I'd refer to uh, uh, illegal house gatherings, 
parties, if you may, um, and we've certainly seen a spike in our use of the legislation to deal with these types of incidents. Um, as I said, they've, they've aligned to pay weekend at the end of January and pay weekend at the end of February. Um, actually, if, if you take a step back from the pandemic, those are two very, very busy weekends for us always. A uh, lot of pressure after Christmas financially, we find in January and then the pay weekend into January. So in a normal context, crime and disorder spikes in those weekends uh, out with the pandemic. So uh, it's possibly not that unusual that the spike has taken place, but it's slightly different elements that we're dealing with. Certainly with the use of enforcement and issuing a fixed penalty notices for those two weekends, probably the most significant that we've seen throughout the 12 month period that I've uh, alluded to. Um, perhaps, you know, frustration, uh, you know, public just trying to perhaps bend the rules. Uh, but as I say, we've uh, we've been very, very consistent and very, very fair. Uh, and um, you know those that have found themselves in terms of the other end of enforcement has been right and proper uh, and I'm quite content in relation to that. Mm. As of course we negotiate the roadway route, route map, whatever we want to refer to, out of the pandemic, it will also uh, uh, play bigger challenges in relation to, for example, the licence trade uh, opening up. We should get some indication later today, I believe, from the government in relation to what that route map might look like in the coming weeks and months. Um, but Mr Morrison from Environmental Protective Services is, is on the call today and, and members should have the assurance that throughout the pandemic we've been working hand in glove with our partners in the local authority uh, and particularly within licensing and all forms of licensing um, to make sure that we are as best prepared and indeed the trade is as best prepared for the transition out so that the assurance to members is that we'll continue having those conversations and continue to work with local authority and protective services and the trade uh, to support the journey out whatever that might look like uh, and we'll rely on the experience that we've gained uh, both locally in the lockdown in Aberdeen in August uh, and more broadly throughout the pandemic. Uh, happy to take any questions in relation to what I've said and I'm equally happy just to continue on to the uh, performance report and take questions at the end, convener. You're on mute, convener. Indeed, indeed I am. Trying to minimise noises. Um, I don't see any hand. Oh, well, there, yes, there is one hand just come up now. OK, well, if there's a few questions, we can take them now then. So it's Councillor Townsend. Would you like to ask a question? Thank you, convener. It's just one very brief question for Chief Superintendent. Uh, I wonder if you could make comment on or advise us uh, historically, perhaps a, a large football match when there's maybe hundreds of supporters uh, being violent or whatever, police officers could feel overwhelmed and have to regroup, et cetera, et cetera. In the uh, lockdown uh, and the pandemic situation, have has he an opinion on officers being overwhelmed by less criminality by a crowd of uh, persons, but uh, social distancing disappearing and them being very boisterous. And how is that treated for the level of uh, arrest or charging or court? Are you happy to answer that? Yes, um, so, so in, in terms of dealing with, um, I suppose, disorderly crowds and, and groups, uh, Councillor Townsend, our, our tactics haven't changed in relation to that. We are conscious in relation to social distancing um, and um, you know the, the, the guidance and the regulations that the pandemic has brought upon us but uh, often in these cases uh, it's about the, the, the imperative is broader public order uh, and maintaining that and perhaps then slower time piecing together and identifying uh, key individuals that's involved and then uh, as I say in slower time uh, picking them off in relation to taking the the right course of action. Uh, as you'll know from your, your, your own experience, Councillor Townsend, that football matches quite often, if you wade into a situation, you could often make things worse from a public order perspective. And uh, in simple terms, it's often better to, to bide your time, gather evidence and then take action uh, in a more controlled way that won't uh, jeopardise pu broader public safety. So hopefully that's covered your point. That's perfect, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I don't see any other questions. 
Um, we have Councillor Duncan and Councillor Houghton, convener. Sorry, I didn't see those at all, actually. Well, thank you for drawing that to my attention. Councillor Duncan. Thank you. I, I had a question on resourcing because clearly um, officers' time has been used slightly differently during the pandemic and um, partly through enforcing the pandemic restrictions, but also because of the very significant reductions in some of the crimes that we normally see. Are you working on the assumption that crime will increase again when the lockdown restrictions are eased? And what are your plans for shifting resources back into dealing with the stuff that you used to deal with? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Duncan. It's, it's a good point. And we've been gamefully employed throughout. Uh, some of that demand, as you quite rightly highlighted, has, has changed slightly. It's my anticipation that it will revert back to the more traditional types of demand that we've had pre, um, you know, as has been indicated previously. Uh, on a Friday and a Saturday night, we've always dealt with noisy parties. The context is just slightly different at the moment, so it's not unusual for us to be attending at people's homes to tell them to turn the music down. The challenge that we've got at the moment is it's not necessarily just turning the music down, it's the fact that they've actually got more people in their address or people breaching legislation and dress, which is slightly more unique. So uh, I, I don't think the pandemic has invited, uh, sorry, has invented the, the concept of the party. I think that was there, uh, you know, well in advance of that. So it's put a slightly different lens on, th on things. And, uh, you know, my own assessment is that, you know, hopefully as the pandemic eases and the, the legislation, which as we all know, it's fairly you know, challenging and, and some might say draconian in relation to it takes us into a place that we really don't want in terms of people's you know, personal space. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's there for a particular reason because of the public health pandemic. Um, but as that led legislation, I think, will be uh, subsides and is, uh, is removed, then it will be you know, back to traditional business in terms of we'll still be dealing with these things, but under a separate and more traditional guise. Hopefully that's answered. Can I just come back with a quick yes. comment and maybe a supplement? There, there's, a, there's, there's the possibility, though, that you're going to have to deal with both things at the same time, isn't there? Because the restrictions aren't suddenly going to disappear and everything goes back to normal. We're going to have this period of gradually reducing restrictions and things then opening up. So I think what I wanted assurance on was that you were confident that you had the resource to deal with all of that. And that your that the officers that your staff are all prepared for it as well, because it will be quite a change again in working conditions for everybody. Yeah, I mean again, I'll give you reassurance. I mean throughout the pandemic, you'll know yourself, uh, rules, regulations, and and legislation. Legislation less so. Legislation has been fairly consistent throughout, uh, but you know my staff have had to adapt and change to that. You know on a monthly basis. And we have managed, I think, quite professionally to negotiate our way through. We've been very, very consistent with our message to the public and we've you know, been very, very supportive in terms of the challenge. And I'm equally confident that as we negotiate our way out of this, and as you say, it's that blend of uh, new legislation and it going back to kind of uh, more challenging and perhaps older, you know, well-known legislation that we'll uh, work our way through that. Of course, there'll be challenges and of course, there'll be times where perhaps we have to scratch our head, but uh, that, that's policing, I suppose. OK, thank you for your questions, Councillor Duncan, and uh, thank you for the response. Um, I just wondered, but before I bring in Councillor Houghton, I think he wants to ask a question. Can I ask, and maybe it's a bit candid, but can I ask you, Chief Superintendent, please, how is the morale in, in the police? I mean, you're you're at the coal face of everything dealing with it, and you've just said you know the different circumstances and having to adapt. The legislation's been consistent, but having to adapt to different situations. Um, how are the police off? The, the police. I think in general terms, um, we, we've always had a very positive workforce in the northeast. Um, you know, I suppose to to. To the indicative of that would be that um, our absence rates throughout the pandemic uh, have been incredibly low, considering, um, and you know the compliance, generally speaking, with staff. We've had our challenges, as every other organisation has had, in terms of making sure that everybody complies. But there's been a real desire from the police officers, police staff, the volunteers that we've got in terms of special constables and youth volunteers. 
to do their bit and I would suggest that that is indicative of a positive working environment and an, envi work, an environment that uh, people want to serve the local uh, population. Um, so uh, my broad assessment is that you know, staff are um, challenged as they are, as we all are in our personal lives in terms of the restrictions, frustrated in their personal lives in terms of the challenges and restrictions that we're all facing. But from a work perspective, uh, they are getting on with their work in a very positive and productive way. Thank you. That's actually really very reassuring to hear because um, I know how difficult it, it must be. But uh, and I suppose in, in compliments to yourself uh, for leading um, a, a team that continues to keep us safe. So thank you for that. Councillor Houghton, do you have a question? I can't see. Yep, there's your hand. Thank you, Convina. Um, and it was actually, the first one was going to be what you just asked, that was perfect. But um, no, I just wanted to begin by just um, thanking uh, the police for a kind of a, what I feel has been a, sort of the very kind of like professional discretionary way that I think has been handled. And I think that's been appreciated a lot. And, um, you know, we have seen in the past over the summer months, you know, there was some issues, I think, um, down in the central belt and that. And I don't feel like we've had sort of the same kind of um, contention up here. And I think that's that's to the credit of, you know, the guys on the guys and girls on, on the street. And I think we're all very, very grateful for that. Um, my qu question was just in terms of sort of the changing nature of um, compliance and how effective do you still feel the kind of the messaging's been? Um, are you, is it when you're just you know you, you're being called to the guy the police officers are being called to situations? Is it just the case now of everybody knows the rules but they just ignore them, or is there still people who just you know they just didn't realise what was and what wasn't allowed? Yeah, I think so. You probably partially answered that, uh, Councillor Houghton. So, from from our perspective, um, I think everybody really understands uh, what they can and can't do. So, the the kind of process of us going through education with people in terms of, you know, you really shouldn't be doing this. Uh, I think people have had long enough and understand it. Um, so, you know, if you've got fifteen people in your house and you're playing music and they're not from your household. Uh, we can predict the outcome is that people will end up uh, at the other side of uh, some enforcement activity, either uh, fixed penalty notices or the, the household have been reported to the Crown Office in relation to potential uh, crimes. Um, however, there are still times where we'll use discretion and individuals that perhaps have misinterpreted um, the, the legislation uh, in a genuine belief that what they're doing isn't isn't criminal. So um, we're sensitive to that and it isn't quite black and white. But you know, legislation isn't quite black and white. There is always areas of grey in amongst it. And I think it's uh, it's important that we continue to be consistent in applying that. That's great. Thank you, Kavita. Thank, thank you. Um, Councillor Duncan, just checking that you're... Do you have another question? Your hand's still up. Just want to check. Or is it historical? Convener, I think there's a sticky hand syndrome happening okay, today, to be perfectly honest. That. That's fine. Um, I just wanted to make sure everyone's OK, so that, that's fine. Okay. Councillor Allard has his hand up, as right. does Councillor Greg. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Allard. Thank you very much, Convener. And I would like to add my thanks to the uh, uh, Chief Superintendent and uh, to the police forces for all they did, like Councillor Houghton said, a particularly some example of a disturbance with neighbours. As councillors, we got a lot of uh, this feedback, and the feedback has been very, very good uh, from the cases I dealt with. Uh, they were very pleased with the way the police operated very quickly and, and, and sorted out the, the issue. Even if it's challenging, it's challenging for people as well to understand what the legislation is and what the police should do, shouldn't do. So, so that's great. And regarding the uh, verbal update that you just gave us, and thank you very much for it. And when you talked about the data and how much you rescue uh, any report will have in two, three, four years time. It, would it be possible maybe to think already that that data should be either taken out of, you know, during the pandemic to not skew the, the trend, or maybe to having uh, uh, two sets of data, one with and one without, just to make sure that it, it doesn't affect the trend of the work that the Police Scotland or even the fire, fire and Rescue Service are doing, just to make sure that we get that 
proper information uh, and takes account of the differences uh, during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allard. Are you able to give a response to that or is that something to consider? I'm really sorry, convener. I didn't pick up much of what was said there. It was poor network quality. So if, if you're able to articulate the question to me, I can respond. Apologies. Um, right. OK, thank you. I think what I what I took from the question was they're looking for almost like a, a before and after when you're saying that how the, the pandemic um, when we go back to normal and how things will be, are you able to almost have like a, a before situation and after situation? Is, I'm just going to say, Councillor Allard, is that, what, yes. is that in essence what you were saying? Yes, it's a question of how do we make sure it doesn't skew the report that we'll get in a few years' time? And if it's a possibility to have two sets of data in parallel, one which takes what happened during the pandemic and one which doesn't take it, take it out of the data. Thank you. Yeah, so... so so, Kabir, I think th th those would be viable considerations for the future. And I think it's uh, it, it probably won't impact, as I say, probably for, from my perspective, I think it will be after sort of 18 to 24 months time, really, before that we start to see that the figures are becoming a little bit, uh, you know, the, the kind of validity of the figures because of the pandemic. So, uh, so yes, absolutely. And I think that that's a that will be something that will have to be decided at that point in the future in terms of the context round about the figures for 2021 20, in terms of uh, uh, if they're accurate or not. In well, they are accurate, but in terms of the context. So, yes, that's a fair point by Council Arad, and we'll, uh, we'll obviously take that consideration on board. OK, thank you very much. Um, was there any other questions? Derek, I can't see any hands on my, uh, my screen. So. Uh, Council Councillor Greg, convener. Oh, okay, Councillor Greg. Yes, thank you, and uh, thank you, Chief Did Superintendent. You, Councillor Greg. I'm s yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm especially grateful, Chief Su Superintendent, to the community and the specialist teams who have had to adapt to the specific challenge of moving their focus from the private to the public spaces um, because I, I, I'm sure that tackling crime and disorder in home environments will undoubtedly create difficult, um, sometimes high risk situations because these are potentially emotive and chaotic, chaotic um, circumstances uh, and it could be difficult to operate in these confined and compromising spaces um, where officers have to identify who are the individuals involved? What's the nature of the wrongdoing? Who are who are the victims? And there will be some reluctance, I imagine, to engage, even to disclose um, harm and crime on the part of victims. So th thank you to the teams for being so for being so uh, adaptable, for being able to adapt so effectively to these um, new priorities. But ha has has this shift involved any additional dedicated forms of frontline training has there been has there been capacity provided to ensure that there is the necessary training so that um so the officers know how to how to react in these changed circumstances for example national programs or policies or anything like that Thank you, Councillor Greg. So, in short, yes, there have been uh, sort of national guidance and using the technology that we're using today uh, to ensure that staff are fully briefed and kept up to date with the developing picture and the uh, the changes in terms of guidance, recommendations, and uh, the tiers that we've we've all faced. So, as I said, it's been a, it's been a, a constantly shifting sands for the last twelve months and will continue to be for quite some time. The broader piece round about training per se, that has been a challenge for us as it's been for other public uh, and private sector organisations and we are looking at innovative ways to kind of continue to professionally develop and train our staff um, going forward uh, and there may be positives that actually come out of the pandemic in that uh, many forms of training might be delivered now in a remote way as opposed to a classroom based uh, facility. So. Uh, that's maybe something that we should be grateful in terms of uh, far more flexibility and far more numbers of people able to trend, attend uh, training courses, Councillor Greg. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chief Superintendent. And uh, no more questions. We will be moving on to yeah, the next item. We, we do have Councillor McGregor has just a second put his hand up. Well, I haven't quite just finished there, Derek. Sorry, oh, sorry, apologies. Um, no, just, no, no, not at all, not at all. I know we're I'm only seeing the Chief Superintendent here, and there's myself. But just to remind Councillor Greg, you go through the chair, you know it's standing orders. Next time, I won't take the question. I give you the courtesy. Give me the courtesy. That's it. Final. Councillor McGregor, uh, please do come in with your question. Thanks very much, Kintina. Um I'm well aware that there are things that are going to change um, and that some behaviours are temporary. Some behaviours are temporary behaviours. Um, and during this uh, during this pandemic, for instance, there's been less of the, the drunkenness and, and lawlessness and uh, just folk out of control. And perhaps that will go back or perhaps some folk will uh, realise the error of their ways and behave more in the future. But there will be other people who have suffered mentally because of the isolation during this lockdown and uh, officers will want to be aware of that. So I'm sure that will be part of your training uh, programme for, for the future. So thanks for that. Thank you for your comment there. Chief Superintendent, do you want to respond to that? I think you've kind of said that actually through the whole discuss various discussions. We are in a changing period of time. Do you want to comment on that? Derek, has things frozen or? No, Mr. McDonald, I think, has gone on mute. There oh, we go. No. no, I don't think he is actually. No, I'm, no I'm, I was. Uh, <laughs> it's obviously a network issue. Yeah, so um, I absolutely accept the points from Councillor McGregor, and it's something that we are uh, acutely aware of and working with partners in relation to the challenges around about mental health and how that manifests in the coming months and years, Convener. Thank you. I think that's very important, and I think actually it was reflected also in the comments uh, from Councillor um, Townsend earlier with his question about uh, caught death. It's how things impact on your life later on. Right. Thanks for all that. I think that's Thank been you. a very robust and helpful conversation regarding the current situation with pandemic and how it's affecting the police. And um, yes, our, our thanks do go to the police for all that they are doing. You said you are in the the front line. So can we just now move on? So that was technically item 11. So we would move on to or go back um, on to item 9, which I said earlier was on pages 17 to 42. There are some very interesting statistics um, which I think reflecting as we have discussed um, earlier um, to reflect the pandemic. But I mean, if you want to highlight things but I would actually just like to compliment you on your introductory letter that I think it is it's very heartfelt and it's encouraging to see that crime reduction has gone down but it is it does come across very a very personal way so thank you for that but would you like to talk us through or highlight or do you want to just go straight into questions Thank you, Convener. I'll just touch upon some, some key points and happy to take questions at the end. Uh, all members have had the report for, for a wee bit of time now, so you've had a chance to peruse and scrutinise it, so I don't intend to go through it sort of line by line and just highlight some of the, the areas. Uh, complaints about the police members will notice that there's been an increase of 35 plus complaints. Um, and that's obviously the first half of the reporting period. It's a little bit you know behind, as it were, in terms of where we are. Uh, I think in terms of context, there is no patterns or significant concerns around about uh, the increase, i.e. I there, is, there is no particular trends or, or, or anything that we're identifying. Again, for context, within a city, we're dealing with between three and 400 incidents every day of the week, and we've obviously got a high level of interaction with the public. Many of the complaints, um, certainly in the first six months of this year, have actually been through the lens that we've just been speaking about quite broadly this morning about the COVID lens. And I don't think it would come as any surprise to some members that uh, often we're the public body that the public are having the face to face interaction with and frustrations round about their understanding of legislation guidance, frustrations more broadly about the position that we all find ourselves in. Uh, and sometimes the, my officers are the 
bearing the brunt of that and uh, people are uh, perhaps have got time and capacity to, to to email in their concerns and they've been investigated um, what we have seen is as the pandemic has continued some of those types of complaints have leveled out um, and as I say in general there, there is nothing significant in relation to any trends or any concerns that we have about the increase there is there is an increase uh, and there's a number of reasons I think for that moving on to violence as is touched upon in my communication it's uh, it's down in almost every category and detections are up which is a really good position to be in uh, robbery uh, in terms of the violence categories we've seen a slight increase members should take a little bit of reassurance that uh, in these types of crimes most of the individuals are actually known to each other uh, so these aren't as our class you know random attacks of members of the public in the street these are uh, associates on associates um, and often involve uh, low level uh, or other criminal type behavior um, again our detections are very healthy in relation to that and it's something that we've been focusing on fire raising has been touched upon um, by councillor duncan earlier i know her ward covers an area which that there are some challenges and, and uh, bruce from the uh, scottish fire and rescue services here but we have seen an increase in relation to that however that is linked to one specific inquiry uh, and there's a male currently subject to criminal proceedings and there's multiple locations in relation to that so i'm clearly limited as to what i can say because there's live criminal proceedings but the reassurance members should take is there is an increase it's linked to one individual and it's linked to multiple locations that have been detected through really good uh, partnership working hate crime slightly higher levels uh, initially in the first half of the year they have now started to balance out as the year has continued uh, again this is linked to the uh, paper that i'll talk about uh, post the performance report approximately 22 percent of all hate crime that is reported is actually linked to comments have been made to police officers that are dealing with individuals for other types of crimes or offences so generally speaking a high number of the hate crimes that we witness within the city and across the northeast are uh, ancillary to a primary offence or charge so in simple terms often these things happen when we are dealing with someone in relation to a separate criminal matter um, there aren't any significant trends in the city in relation to people being targeted because uh, of from a hate crime perspective and if there is or if there is anything developing we work uh, very very closely with partners to make sure that all early intervention and prevention is put in place uh, acquisitive crime uh, all forms are down 26 over 26 percent which uh, is down on the five-year average which is quite incredible uh, down a quarter i think any of us would accept that in relation to a significant reduction uh, at the last scrutiny meeting i touched upon fraud and it's been touched upon by councillor townsend earlier today in relation to the cyber piece and i'm happy to sort of not to dwell on this but take a paper back at some later uh, committee in relation to talk about more detail in relation to cyber crime in particular fraud however we do we do see evidence of this on a daily basis throughout the city um, and again i really appeal to members and to support us in terms of constituents that banking and financial institutions do not phone you up and ask you to take action with your accounts they don't send you spurious unannounced emails and we all know that some of these approaches can be quite sophisticated if your bank needs to get hold of you and you decline or you delete they will make other efforts to get in touch with including writing a letter old-fashioned to you nothing is so urgent that you need to deal with it right there right now uh, and as i've touched upon to other uh, public protection committees across the, the the northeast in all my experience uh, with banks dealing with them for current accounts mortgage and various other financial transactions any contact i've had with a bank has always been anticipated i've never had in all my career and all my working life a random contact from a financial institution has always been planned and you anticipate it and we really need to get that message out that if you're not expecting it ignore delete hang up that's the best form of defense and if something looks too good to be true experience tells us is it is too good to be true and um, so uh, some some basic kind of principles there but i'm happy to take a more detailed report back to committee 
to talk this through and flesh out a bit what because there are broader issues in terms of vulnerability which i'm sure members want to discuss also so i'm happy to do that convener at some point in the future uh, th thank you very much, Chief Superintendent. I think actually th that what you've said uh, is very important and I think it would be good to bring another uh, more detailed report back on that. Um, I know, for instance, uh, I would think it's actually a great thing you've come up with ignore, delete, hang up. That might You might have something there, actually. Um, it, I think it is very important, particularly for older people, and I know that I'm dealing with some of those situations Personally, just now, the levels you have to go through for power of attorney and so on, it is very rigorous um, to be able to do anything. So um, I would concur with what you, you say. Now, I've had a question in the chat, and I don't know if you've got it or not. It's from Councillor Mason, and he was asking in terms of the complaints that come in, are they, I think this is complaints against the police in, rel in relation to what you said, is that in the demographic, is it demographics or geographics is asked? I don't know if you're seeing that. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, you uh, are. You can see that. OK. Yeah. So, no, the, 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 there's 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 no real. Um, occasionally there are pockets of complaints, but they're often linked to individuals uh, and perhaps their grievance as opposed to a sort of geographical challenges that we have. We don't see across the city particular areas that have higher levels. It's uh, it's fairly even across the city, but we often have individuals that, um, as I say, for a particular grievance, uh, will uh, re will complain and will report on a very regular basis. And that can, uh, we can pick up on that and we can work with them and try and address their, uh, their, their concerns as best possible we can. Happy to move on if you're content um, with that. I've got two or three questions. So I've got Councillor Dunbar, Councillor Mason, and then Councillor Townsend. So Councillor okay. Dunbar. Hello, my question was really around, um, you know, the reporting on page 34 and 35, specifically around the increase um, of domestic abuse. And what I'm trying to find out is, um, I've seen, you know, like some of the very good um, coverage that you've done in the local press um, around the, the domestic abuse campaign. And I'm just trying to find out specifically in relation to, um, you know, black and minority ethnic communities that you've been trying to, you know, like roll the messages out to, the extent to which you've maybe worked with those communities leaders, um, you know, because it isn't obviously just about, you know, like translating or interpreting, you know, like these messages. Um, and also about, um, you know, if the, is there a sort of direct impact in terms of you roll out these messages and there is a higher incidence of some reporting coming back, whether that's in the black and minority ethnic communities or the wider, um, you know, white Scottish, however people want to define these things, communities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dunbar. I think if you could go into mute Councillor Dunbar, otherwise I get like a stereotype effect. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, yeah, so we, we've obviously done a huge amount of work over many, many years in the North East, right across the population and right across the demographic of the city. Uh, working with faith leaders and community leaders um, uh, and all sorts of um, areas where we can get the message out. Um, and we're probably grateful for that work that we've done for many, many years that we haven't had to, to an extent, scramble about because of the, the pandemic and, and, and try to get that out there. Um, I, I think, you know, I touched upon it earlier in terms of my update about where we are with the, with the pandemic, and I was going to touch upon it as we're going to do in terms of the protecting people at harm uh, in the report. Uh, we, and we accept that it must be very, very difficult for individuals out there that uh, have probably had to spend more time with, uh, with, with individuals that they don't want to spend time with because of the lockdown. Um, what we have seen is still high levels of reporting. That's one area that actually is up. You'll see the report and it has continued throughout that actually the levels of uh, calls in relation to domestic abuse and uh, coercive control and other elements around about domestic type uh, behaviour uh, have continued to be reported to 
fairly strongly, which gives us some confidence to Council, uh, uh, sorry, Councillor Dunbar, that you know we are. Ha I'd be really concerned if our levels in relation to domestic abuse were down throughout the pandemic. They're not. They're up, which is you know it's a, it's a it's a positive actually that we see that. But again, I think we're kidding ourselves if we believe that we are seeing everything that that we should be seeing round about this. The the point I've made about that particular issue is that. Not everything that happens is reported to us, and that's always been the case, you know, out with the pandemic, during a pandemic. But undoubtedly, we'll have seen, or will there be evidence coming out of the pandemic? I'm sure that there are people out there that are still afraid to report uh, domestic incidences or violence or child protection or adult protection, the whole gambit of those issues, because of the type of dynamic that they're living in and perhaps dependent on people in the current situation for that support. And as we work our way out of the pandemic, it is my belief, and I think others professionals' beliefs, that we, we will see an increase in relation to uh, some of the occurrences that have taken place over the last 12 months that people have been reluctant to report. And the confidence you should take, Council Dunbar, is that you know we, we, we're anticipating that and we'll shift resource into that area um, to, 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 to make sure we've got resources to kind of deal with any increase in relation to the public protection piece. We're continuing to do the publicity. You'll see that our social media and all other kind of platforms that we've got. We're continuing to do all the work that we've done in relation to community leaders and community figures and faith leaders right across the spectrum. None of that has stopped. If anything, we've doubled our efforts round about that. Um, and there are so, so many opportunities for people to report through third party reporting services. Um, and it's easier now, I would respectfully suggest, to report any of those types of concerns and it's ever been but I totally respect the position that people may not be ready to report these types of occurrences because of the they're perhaps reliant on the individual sadly that they're living with to support them hopefully that's answered your question yes thank you I think it has and I think that um you know some of the some of the big social changes that we've certainly witnessed, you know, I, I would say in my lifetime as, um, you know, somebody that's been a, around a while, <laughs> um, are really positive. I think, um, you know, there's been some discussion in the last couple of years around, you know, whether, um, you know, misogyny and femicide, you know, like the femicide um, census campaign that really got quite high profile um, I think through International Women's Day, and I'm sure there may be some, you know, some further changes in the way that we saw the coercive control legislation being introduced um, that will impact on, um, you know, like the nature of what you're describing. I think um, shows how there can be sustained um, control and abuse over a number of years that the police don't necessarily become. Um, involved in until you know something more serious let's say um happens and i absolutely agree with that and i think the other point is that none of us can control when somebody is ready to disclose information and yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll see disclosures for things that happened a week ago a month ago a year ago and mm -hmm. sometimes 10 15 years ago because it just takes um you know a catalyst sometimes in someone's life just to have the the confidence and the belief to report uh, you know some of the some of the challenges they face so yeah we're alert to that and we'll do everything we possibly can in relation to the you know hidden harm is the term it's been used hidden harm respectfully has always been there but uh, as i've touched upon today i believe that because of the pandemic and some of the conditions it's probably created an environment that's created additional hidden harm okay thank you Thank you for the question, and um, I would concur with your, uh, your response, Chief Superintendent. Uh, I've recently been engaging with Grampian Women's Aid, and they were saying as much in terms of some, some of the pre pre professions women are in, um, lesser paid, and they ended up being furloughed, being at home, and no option to work. It intensified their, their problems and situations. Um, so I have a couple of hands here still, uh, Councillor Mason and then Councillor Townsend, and then we'll move on. Councillor Mason. 
Councillor Mason was having uh, technical issues and being able to speak previously. I'm wondering if it's actually a follow on from when okay. he had his hand up to the message. So, okay, so he put a question through the chat, which we addressed. Um, Councillor Mason, are you okay or do you want to ask a question? I think he's okay because uh, I'm not hearing anything. If you have anything else, put it in the chat. Um, I have to say, I've never thought I'd be speaking like this. Put it in the chat. So <laughs> I'm surprising myself. But anyway, we'll go on to Councillor Townsend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, I wholly concur with the, your uh, comments on the Chief Superintendent's intro letter. Uh, he mentioned the four E's approach, and I have to say I'm guilty of having forgotten one of the E's. It's just as an aside. Engage, explain, and I've moved straight to the fourth, so you could maybe give me the other E just as an aside. That educate? No, educate. It was engage, explain, educate. And enforce, right? Thank you. That, that wasn't the question. That was just me trying to get myself. So uh, the question is page 25. It mentions there's a satisfaction rate of 75%, 26.9% uh, increase in complaints. And the question, first part of the question is, is this uh, increase due to ignorance or misunderstanding, perhaps, of uh, rules, regulations, legislation, as opposed to anything else? And the second part of the question is, uh, these complaints uh, are predominantly dealt with by frontline resolution process. I just wondered what percentage were successfully dealt with. That's the first question. Okay, thank you, Councillor Townsend. Um, I, I would I accept your point in terms of ignorance or lack of. I, I think it's, there's an element of frustration. I think from a, a, a number of the public that you know we're talking about the first six months of the, the pandemic, and as I touched upon perhaps in my my, my summary about complaints, um, we we were often the the, the only face, the, the first face that they saw in relation to. Uh, you know whatever they were dealing or the, you know they, they called us about and I think some of that pent up frustration uh, round about the, the situation that everybody frankly found themselves in manifested itself into probably you know at times aggression and abuse towards police officers which then materialized into uh, complaining about the actions of police officers who were trying their best to unpick and work their way through which was unprecedented and, and, and challenging times so you know absolutely did we get everything right Councillor Townsend no uh, was there learning for us at various points throughout this absolutely we all every single one of us learned something new every single day and you know I'm no different to that so there's probably a combination of frustration and you know, lack of understanding and lack of knowledge round about how things um, and you know it was it was effectively as we know changing on a weekly monthly basis what was legislation what was guidance what was a recommendation so I think quite often the public have just assimilated all that into it's against the law or it's not against the law actually the legislation has been quite static there's been about four or five key elements of legislation throughout which have have not really changed that much the guidance has shifted constantly but I think the public perception is that all of that is just about it's all legislation it's like you know if you go in you know speak to your neighbor or go into your neighbor's house you're breaking the law at one point well actually it was guidance as opposed to being legislation it is now legislation so uh, it must be difficult and it must have been difficult for uh, it was difficult for police officers piecing our way through that so uh, lay people and the you know members of the public and all the information it was very very uh, confusing and, and again there's, there's there's contrary views from uh, you know, you could watch the television and one one briefing from Westminster and one briefing from uh, Holyrood and actually talking about two totally different things. So it must be really difficult for the public to actually, you know, pin down what exactly applies at times. So that's why we've taken the 4 E's approach to actually just be sympathetic and be engaging. Uh, and, you know, I think vastly it's it's worked. But there have been complaints, there have been concerns. We'll look at that, we'll reflect, and if there's any learning, mm -hmm. Councillor Townsend, we'll take that and take it on the chin. And your other point was. Uh, maybe answered it. What percentage? What percentage? Frontline residents, generally between 50 and 60% of all their complaints are dealt with at FLR, first line resolution. Thank you. I've got a second question, if I could, Kavir. Yes. 
On you go. Uh, it's on page 35, and it mentions that personal images sent without consent or abusive messages over the internet or social media collapse the preventative messaging under eyes and ears open campaign, which includes messages about cyber safety, asking members of the public to report any related suspicions. So my question is, uh, what is the best mode of reporting in these circumstances? Would dialing 101 uh, allow a, a report? Would it be better to email? And further to the question, what mechanisms are in place for younger age groups to report directly without involving an adult, i.e. you know, a child or a young person? What's the best advice for them to report something? Okay, I'll start with the child uh, element. So schools are still, you know, we know that schools have been disrupted in terms of the structure, but there's still the appropriate mechanisms in terms of GERFIC and, um, you know, the appropriate adults reporting in terms of uh, guidance and, and uh, you know, that kind of structure is there. So if anybody, any child needs any support, uh, I would, you know, request that they, they link into the established guidance and support mechanisms that are there from a schooling perspective, they still are there and they're still very, very robust. Um, in terms of other options, all of the above, I mean, uh, whatever someone is comfortable with in terms of uh, you can contact us through email, through 101. And again, one of the positives come out of this, and I, we updated the, the, the board previously about the contact assessment model that's been established up in Inverness. We obviously now have the ability to interact with people in terms of taking their complaint virtually, Councillor Townsend. So, you know, we don't have to, you know, physically see someone as it were. We can see someone virtually. We can deal with them over the telephone. Um, but you know, the, the the whole issue around about digital images and sharing of digital images, very much a developing, uh, you know, new air crime trend, uh, and it is very much here to stay. I'd sadly say, and uh, it's it's something that. Uh, if anyone has any issues of concern or they are uh, feel they've been a victim of that, I'd encourage them to communicate with us and we'll provide appropriate support and investigate appropriately, Councillor Townsend. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Can we now got one final question that's relation to the counter-terrorism domestic extremism that was reported in the report? It's just a very quick question. If we could. Mm -hmm. uh, on page 39, uh, Chief Super, you say it, our unique model embeds contest into our community policing teams has been recognised nationally as good practice. Uh, are you confident or do you think that the North East Division's approach will be replicated throughout the fall? Yeah, I think it's pan north. It's certainly from my experience in Highlands and Islands, that was the case there, Councillor Townsend too. So it's, uh, I think the model that we have in relation to community policing um, is very, very effective and other areas of the country are looking at that and uh, we're looking to share how we go about our business. So yeah, I think it will ripple across the country. Many thanks, Chief. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. For Thank you for your questions. Okay, so committee, I'm just going to say, can our members, can we, um, uh, agree and end endorse the report, please. Just someone to say yes. Agreed. Thank you. Thanks for it, uh, Dunbar. Thank you. If I may, convener, I, I noticed Councillor Allard's hand oh. still appears up. I didn't see that at all, but we've actually already agreed it. So, yeah. um. I didn't see any hand there at all. My apologies, but we have agreed. We'll, we'll move on um, to the next report, which is item 10. Again, it's uh, with a chief superintendent and um, the violence towards police staff, which the report, as I remember, really was generated as a, as a result of your self count of Townsend. So, uh, Chief Superintendent, would you want to? Yeah. Absolutely. So yes, as, as you touched upon in, in autumn 2020, uh, as a result of a request from uh, Councillor Townsend to, I think it was in the back of the public commitments that the Chief Constable had made uh, in relation to protecting officers and um, drawing a line in relation to uh, the violence towards police staff. Um, so nationally, locally, there's a, there's a very cohesive strategy, obviously led by the Chief. A national perspective supported by myself and the senior leadership team right across the northeast and in the city. Uh, the report they've got in front of you is, I think, pretty self-explanatory. Um, 
and we're, we're firmly seeking to change the culture or perception that I suppose in simple terms convener that police officers and police staff are in inverted commas fair game in the use of violence and abuse towards them. Mm -hmm. I touched upon you know, 22 percent of the, the, the race hate crime in Aberdeen City is linked to abusive comments made to police officers because of uh, you know race hate elements. Um, so that, that's indicative of the type of challenges that we've got. Of course, from a policing perspective, we, we always have to deal with and will have to deal with challenging, dynamic and unpredictable situations. People who are volatile, people who are abusive, that's just the nature of, of our business. But uh, I firmly believe and the Chief Constable firmly believes that we shouldn't accept that because of that, that any of our staff um, should be at the receiving end of mindless violence, which can have a uh, you know, a significant impact both at the material time, short, medium, long term. Uh, there could be rehabil rehabilitation in relation to some of these assaults upon officers and if ultimately communities have been deprived of uh, staff because of these types of actions. Uh, and again, I think it's important just the local context uh, for Aberdeen City, just because that's one point that's not mentioned because it's a broad report for the pan northeast area. So just so members are aware, and these figures are, are, are right up to date, up to the 5th of March, so that it's not for the first six months, this is you know almost year end figures as it were. We've recorded 384 recorded offences against police officers, police staff in relation to violence against them in Aberdeen City. Last year to date, that was 322. And the five year average, again, just to give you a sense check in terms of where we are, is 333. So it would indicate that um, we are 62 crimes, or if my figures are correct, 20%, almost 20% up on this time last year in relation to violence, and actually 15% up on the five year average. So all the indications show that this actually is a real concern, um, and it's something that you know, we're working really, really closely with various partners, so as mentioned in terms of the Crown Office and Procurative Fiscal Service. Uh, and other key elements in terms of recognising and ensuring that violence towards police officers and police staff going about their lawful duty isn't acceptable. And those that do think it's acceptable actually get the full force in relation to the law and in relation to the outcomes. So as I say, I'm quite happy to take some questions and that local context might be helpful for members. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, I would just like to place on record there is absolutely no place for violence anywhere and we're certainly not against the, the police that are there to, to keep us safe. I do um, I, I do have a couple of questions my, myself and one of them is I just wondered, well, I have a particular view about um, Facebook and social media, but do you um, think that they contribute towards the violence against the, the, the police in when situations arise and comments, often unfounded, um, might uh, contribute in some way. I can see some of the rubbish that people put on. Um, I, I can't think of any other detritus, perhaps, um, of, of the comments that they put on. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if they contribute, but they don't help in terms of that broader it's a culture that we need to look at and need to challenge in terms of, you know, there is a perception, I think, in uh, areas of the community and with individuals that actually the police are inverted commas fair game in relation yeah. to, you know, that's just one, it's just an additional charge really and it shouldn't be like that and I think yeah. uh, we need to see the consequences of those actions playing out in terms of uh, court disposal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then just one other, it was actually 3.2 on the report, page 43, um, the, the last sentence, um, you said that, that there has been an increase in this assaults, so by 9.5%. What does that roughly equate to in terms of police officers or would that be something you would come back and tell us about? Yeah, that, that's across the entire northeast convener, so I, I haven't got the number, I've simply given the numbers for Aberdeen City, so we've seen uh, this year, 62 additional assaults on police officers or police staff um, across the city. So the year's not quite complete. We've still got roughly one month to go from a, when these figures were produced, but we're up already 62 in this time last year, which is uh, fairly significant. Yes, it is. It's it's a, a shocking figure, actually, uh, not acceptable, most certainly. Um, Councillor Townsend, your hand is up. So I assume you do want to come in. 
Yeah, much obliged, Camila. I've just got two questions, if I sure. could. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question, uh, Chief Superintendent, is uh, page 45, 3.12, uh, Officer Safety Training uh, Enhanced uh, Techniques and First Aid, etc. And it mentions increased emphasis on verbal de-escalation. Would that tie in with what you were saying about uh, if you, you, the four E's with, through the pan pandemic uh, to, to engage very strongly uh, and appropriately uh, verbal techniques by officers has, has naturally developed, that you would encourage that, not only the pandemic, but as we move on. Move on. Absolutely, yes, that's, uh, that's very much the approach, is try to resolve it verbally before you lay hands on Councillor Townsend. That's first question, thank you, Camina. And the second question is page 46, at 3.16, uh, it mentions a new individual impact subsection in standard uh, police reports to the fiscal service, uh, allowing victims, including uh, police officers and police staff, to explain how uh, the incident impacted on them. And my question surrounds uh, PS PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or, or uh, mental impact, etc. I assume uh, this is excellent for mentioning uh, the usual, perhaps physical injury that somebody might, but this is a great vehicle for uh, mentioning the mental impact uh, on an officer or, or a person reporting is that it, Absolutely, yes. And uh, again, an assurance that internal in terms of the wellbeing support, if someone um, is or has suffered violence and they are struggling with elements of that in terms of rehabilitation, that there is significant effort and support uh, in terms of the mental health piece too, which I think is vitally important, Councillor Townsend. Thank you for that, Chief. And just as a follow on to that very quickly, uh, you mentioned at 3.17, the launch of uh, uh, an app, useful information uh, for advice on what's accessible uh, for an officer to, to pursue in that regard. I assume uh, there's still a, a, an ability to have face-to-face -face, uh, with uh, immediate supervisors or medical staff, is that right? Well, yeah, all of those uh, aspects are in place. And the, the app, actually interesting enough, um, is, uh, is an app that people download on their own phone. So it's a personal thing that you've got as opposed to a work-related thing. So you've got that app and access to it 24-7 as opposed to, for example, on a work-related digital device that you leave in the office. So uh, uh, the, the, the subscription to that app has been uh, excellent across the organisation uh, and you know some of the uh, just fairly straightforward offers of support that you, you're, you're getting messages on a regular basis in terms of key times of the month. So you know it covers all sorts of elements about financial worries, emotional worries, relationship worries, etc. So it's a very, very useful tool. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Townsend, uh, and thank you, Chief Superintendent. Now, just before um, we would be getting to the point where we would be saying um, discuss, comment, and endorse the report, but I would actually like to add something. But I'm going to need a little bit of um, a, a, a advice. So, Mr. Bell, um, if I get it wrong, I get it wrong. But um, I actually wonder. Is there some way that within that recommendation that we can say something that reflects that the committee um, abhors any as, uh, uh, assaults on the police? Is that is that something that we can actually do or some wording to put into that? Uh, convener, yes, I think I think that would be possible for you to, to do so. And, and, and indeed, the words um, that you suggested there could easily be incorporated within uh, uh, within the decision notice of this committee. Well, I, I would like to see that because, and I would hope I'd have the support of the committee because it's just violence isn't accept, is not acceptable and violence against the police is most certainly not acceptable and rising violence against the police is further not acceptable at all. Um, so if there can be some wording, can I just have someone um, from the committee just to sort of speak and agree with me? It doesn't matter who, I'm just needing someone to say, Councillor Mason, thank you, you see your hand, so thank you for that. Um, we can tidy up the wording, what it is, but thank you very Something much. Something along the lines, along the lines of convener that the committee abhors any violence against Police Scotland officers. It's, it's, um, something like that. Yeah. 
is it? I think it need, needs to be recognised the time that we're living in and what is actually happening. And because if we're just if we just say that we're endorsing the report, it's just looking like everything's hunky dory. If that's if that's the candidate, and I want to recognise what the, the police are doing. Convener, if I could just say, yep. can we actually have the recommendation to note the increase of violence towards police officers in the northeast, and then continue your bit yep. about violence being abhorrent? Yep, that, that's fine. I'm happy with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Derek. That's that's helpful. Uh, we can uh, attend to the housekeeping side of that later on. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Superintendent. So. Um, oh, and then finally, we're moving on to item 12, which is the, the, the letter that you provided um, just to give notifying of all the, the changes in the North East Division of the senior management changes. Is there anything you want to say about that, Chief Superintendent? Uh, no, I know it's uh, Councillor Townsend's got his hand back up oh. again. Oh, right. My apologies. Uh, Councillor Townsend? No, apologies, can be I'm just struggling with the technology a wee bit. Oh, I know it's a pest, isn't it? Yeah, so, so in that case, no, um, I just what felt it important that members just had a clear uh, update and articulation in relation to just some of the changes. There was quite a number of changes and uh, you know, uh, just developing the team and making sure that the team was fit for purpose with currently and in the future. So uh, um, some of the individuals will be, uh, if not already, have been in contact with some of the, uh, the members here today and will continue to build on those relationships. But I just felt it was important just to uh, just have that in black and white so that everybody could just see what the kind of uh, the, the situation looked like in terms of the key people. Thank you very much. And I was very happy to have it included in the, the, the paper so that, as you say, everyone can actually see, see the, the changes that are there. Thank you very much for all your contributions uh, for today in the reports. You're, you're very welcome to stay, but I know you're a busy man. So if you want to leave, that's equally fine. We're moving on to so whatever is, is suitable for yourself. Um, so we're moving now on to a uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. It is a, a verbal update and it is reflective of the current lockdown situation. So we have Mr. Parkinson with us. Hello, Mr. Parkinson. Good morning, Convener. Good morning, members. Uh, it's nice to be here this morning. Uh, and good to see you. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I congratulate you for your um, additional workload or not that, that, that you've uh, um, that you've been given. Um, and obviously, we've not met at the committee since then. So um, perhaps there was reflecting. Maybe you might want to expand upon that so the committee can be reassured. And perhaps there are a report later on that your additional work will not change the reporting to the, the and the reporting to the committee and also to the service that you provide provide for the northeast. Yes, absolutely, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so the, the, the change is essentially a, an administration change. Um, the, there is no difference in the teams that will be sitting in any of the, the areas that are part of this merger. Um, it simply means that I will now be responsible for Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire and Murray. So the teams within Aberdeenshire and Murray uh, and Aberdeen City remain unchanged. So the, the commitment to all three scrutiny committees remains unchanged. Um, from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service perspective. In fact, there are some really good opportunities for um, progression for individuals, for development opportunities and, and for some um, stronger synergies to take place. So um, far from being any detriment um, to be felt, it might actually be seen as um, quite a positive with a lot of um, crossing over of, of thinking and ideas and sharing a good practice. So I'm uh, very much looking forward to the opportunity. I'm not sure congratulations are in order. It's a sideways move um, that, will, uh, that will, I'm sure, present some uh, some new and uh, interesting challenges that I'm looking forward to. Thank you for, for that. Um, well, I, I, you can always learn from a new experiences, so um, that's always good. Um, are you happy enough with the discussions that was at the earlier of the meeting in discussing the, the business plan or what reports, thematic reports could come from the uh, fire and rescue service? Absolutely. And thank you for all the suggestions that have been made about thematic reports. Um, I'll have a discussion with uh, Mr Jameson off table to see if it's appropriate that we bring our performance report alongside a thematic report similar to 
the, the approach that's uh, often taken by Police Scotland or whether um, spacing them out so that it's only one report per meeting is more appropriate. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll absolutely bring uh, information to the committee on the subjects that have been highly highlighted. Okay, thank you for that. So you have just, they're going to give us an update, I'm not sure we've got a bit of an echo there, an update regarding how the, the, the fire and rescue service have uh, operated during the COVID period or this lockdown COVID pandemic, terrible situation that we're all still living in. Absolutely. So I have a verbal report and I'm happy to take any questions um, from, from members uh, when we're finished. So you're, you're quite right. The, the, the COVID pandemic has affected everybody in, in a, a raft of different ways. Um, and in the fire service, we have some um, very similar situations compared to other workplaces, but some very unique situations as well. Um, I think it's fair to say it's almost exactly a year that um, the, the lockdown restrictions were put in place. And at that point, we didn't really know how long it was going to last for, but what was clear that we um, had to immediately change our structures to allow us to perform our core functions of responding to emergencies. Um, the management team within the uh, fire service went to a, a war footing, and that was the phrase that was used quite deliberately um, to show a clear change in approach that we would make decisions in a much more streamlined and, and uh, far less bureaucratic manner um, so that we could move with a, a fleetness of foot to make sure that all the, the changing variables were accommodated and we could still uh, serve the communities across Scotland. Unfortunately, through the, the lockdown, we did see an increase in the number of domestic fires and the, the correlated increase in injuries and fatalities that come as a result of domestic fires. And uh, the, the combination of people working and living at home, um, uh, a demonstrable increase in the consumption of alcohol um, all came together to, to unfortunately have the impact of fires in the home. So that was another issue that was unforeseen, but we had to deal with quite quickly uh, and get information out. So we needed to maintain our response uh, and, and that involved a, a root and branch change of all our policies and procedures, uh, all the way from our receipt of call and our um, operations control rooms, where information that normally would never have been considered had to be asked about um, in relation to was MD presenting any symptoms of COVID within the house or even within the car, if it had been a car accident, you know, we wanted to get that information as quickly as possible to hand that back to our responding officers so that they could be um, fully aware of the risks that we're going to be exposed to. We um, were very aware of the need to reduce the number of times, the number of people that were exposed to the potential um, of COVID infection with our response to automatic fire alarms, um, which interestingly has come up as one of the thematic reports that will come in the future about our response to automatic fire alarm systems. So we put in place a blanket reduction in our predetermined attendance to all of these types of incidents across the country, which reduced the number of times that um, firefighters were uh, in a position where they might have been exposed to COVID. And we also had to completely review our protective equipment. Um, so we, we still had to have close contact with our, ourselves on the fire stations, but also with casualties. If you think about the close proximity for um, CPR, for example, um, for, for removing people from car crashes, we, there's a, a need for us to not have that two meter um, social distancing. So we had to completely um, review our PPE and provide equipment that was appropriate. Obviously, we've always had breathing apparatus masks, but it's not really appropriate to wear breathing apparatus at a car crash um, for lots of reasons. So we had to come up with uh, quite innovative solutions for how we would work in those situations. And because of the range of work that we're involved with, um, we spend a lot of time training uh, and maintaining our skills. And a lot of that training is um, practical hands-on sessions. These were um, reduced significantly so that we weren't again putting ourselves in a position where there was unnecessary contact. Um, now, initially, when it was uh, in the early weeks and months, um, that was achievable. But as this lockdown has gone on and on, um, that became more and more of a challenge because um, of skills fade and, uh, and the need to make sure that we are competent in the roles that we carry out. One of the other issues that became apparent was um, succession planning and, and recruitment. Um, in our recruitment process, we have a medical, um, very hard to carry out medicals in the COVID situation. 
Um, we interview people face to face. Um, again, very hard to do that and maintain social distancing. So we've had to introduce a range of new systems, in, including um, just recently a, a raft of promotional interviews that were carried out um, using Teams, just as we're speaking right now, which uh, when you have a panel of three people and somebody's being interviewed and all the possible um, IT issues that might be experienced, uh, uh, it's a very different dynamic. So let me just go into a little bit of detail about how we've kept our firefighters safe um, on our stations. So on our fire stations in Aberdeen City, um, they all have more than one appliance, um, so therefore more than one crew. And if one person in that crew um, has a positive COVID test, then legitimately every person in that crew must self-isolate. We simply don't have the capacity to allow an entire crew on an entire station to not be available for work. So to mitigate that, we've split all our stations into effectively into half, um, where crews are kept in what we're calling a, a bubble of, um, of teammates that they only see those people for the duration of the time they're working. Um, we've got um, PPE being worn on the station all the time in, in the form of uh, face masks, um, hand sanitizers at every single um, doorway where there's a, a common touch point, a brand new regime of cleaning that is carried out on a, um, quite a high frequency every day, um, a complete re-engineering of the, the layout of the stations um, so that people um, have our, our, our roll calls at different times, we have our meals at different times, we have our training sessions at different times. Um, and the only thing we do together now is respond to incidents, um, but with a, an enhanced level of um, PPE whilst we do so. We also, when we do get um, a suggestion that either somebody has been exposed to COVID in their home environment um, or has been on the station and, and then exhibits COVID symptoms, we have had to put in place a, a contract with um, specialist cleaning firms to come in and do a, a deep clean and fog of the station um, within a matter of hours at any point across the whole of Scotland. Um, and, and that has happened on a number of occasions and has been quite successful. So on the stations, it's been a, a complete reworking of everything um, to make sure that we could remain safe in the workplace from COVID. And in fact, we have had spot checks carried out by the health and safety executive, one of which was experienced in Aberdeen, and I'm pleased to say we got a clean bill of health and, and um, commended on the, the situation that we had. In relation to our preventative work and our home fire safety visits in particular, um, obviously the idea of going into folks' homes when we are in uh, lockdown is just not tenable, but we absolutely appreciate that there are people who really need our assistance to keep them safe. So all of our home fire safety visits and requests have been risk assessed on an individual basis and only where there was an identifiable threat either from intentional fire raising or where there was identified that there were no detection devices within the household at all did we send um, a team out to um, make an intervention and put detection in place. And this work was carried out by our specialist community action team um, who are um, not operational firefighters, um, some of whom are uh, who do wear a uniform, but uh, this is a, a team that very much specialise in the partnership work and the protecting the most vulnerable in our community, and they've done a fantastic piece of work throughout the, uh, the COVID pandemic, predominantly working from home, but also coming into uh, to workplaces when necessary. We've also um, got our prevention in the workplace, and, and we might think that a lot of workplaces were closed down, which they were. We think about care homes. Care homes are a workplace, but they're obviously still in operation. So we, we've had to think about how we can maintain our um, legislative requirement to safety in these workplaces. So we came up uh, in Aberdeen City with a, a real piece of innovation, which has now been adopted across the whole of Scotland and um, seen as best practice, and is now been carried in conjunction with the, um, the Care Commission as well to do a, a virtual inspection using live video streaming technology um, on, on smartphones. So um, a team of people from various locations can come together uh, virtually and be guided around the building um, by somebody that's in, in that building working, looking at key points and, and making um, recommendations and comments. So a, a real innovative piece of work that's come very successful. We've carried out a similar approach in relation to how we gather information to keep our firefighters safe. So um, 
We have a process called operational intelligence where we'll go out to workplaces that present a hazard or a risk. Um, and that's to keep our firefighters safe. So we have done a, a similar approach, a, a virtual inspection um, with a, a live stream, streaming device to get information that we then record that is placed on our, um, uh, we've got smart tablets on every fire appliance that the firefighters can access so they've got good information about the building they're going to. Obviously throughout this process we've now got the um, the working from home dimension which is brand new for, for most of us um, and the challenges that can be presented in that environment where you maybe don't see anybody on a day-to-day -day basis and the, the, um, the, the mental health of people is, uh, is at risk more than it has been before. So our health and wellbeing team have done a fantastic piece of work, not just putting together online um, video uh, workout sessions, but also uh, in enhancing and increasing the opportunity to access mental health and um, support, either provided in-house by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service or signposting to external agencies. And there are a number um, that, that could be mentioned, um, not the least of which is SAPR support for the Scottish Fire Service Family Trust. Um, who provide mental health support to those that need it. Um, we've also absolutely spoken with our own teams on a regular basis about the need to maintain good um, mental health regimes, um, to not feel the need to be sitting in front of a, a computer from eight in the morning till five at night, and um, to take breaks, to, to generally, um, and I guess in a nutshell, just be kind to yourself take a break when you need a break and uh, you know what if, if today you've had enough and you want to finish at lunchtime then that's fine you know we need to make sure that we're looking after each other i have to say throughout the whole of lockdown if we, if we use um, attendance levels in the workplace as an indicator of how happy folk are with coming to work in aberdeen city our attendance levels have been absolutely exemplary um, e even even in a non-covid environment they have these figures would hold up as being exemplary um, the attitude and professionalism shown by our firefighters has been first class with a very positive and professional approach shown. Uh, and if we look at some of the more light-hearted hearted, um, aspects, there was a, a blinding lights challenge that took place on the social media platform TikTok. And um, one of our watches in Aberdeen, uh, Amber Watch at Centre, were the very first in Britain to pick up on that uh, and get onto a national platform. Um, at Christmas time, the Red Watch from Central Fire Station um, did a, a socially distanced Santa Claus visit to the um, the Children's Hospital. Um, you know, very much uh, as firefighters always are thinking about how they can help other people. And the final thing I want to mention, convener, is the partnership working that's taken place. Um, as with all things we do in the fire service, we we uh, we work very closely with our key partners and throughout the pandemic, one of the main aspects of this has been demonstrated through the Local Resilience Partnership. So this partnership, um, for those of you that are perhaps unaware of it, is um, a legal entity. Um, it is all the um, Category 1 and Category 2 responders, including police, fire, ambulance, NHS, um, local authority, um, the, the responsibility to deal with a civil contingency emergency, which the coronavirus pandemic obviously is. So the Grampian LRP has, has met consistently, um, sometimes on a four or five times a week basis, um, to make sure that everything we are doing has been focused on the needs of our communities. And that includes setting up the um, Grampian LRP Community Assistance Hub, which was the first of its type in Scotland, and was recognised by the Scottish Government as best practice, and was then commended to all other local uh, resilience partnerships across Scotland as a model to adopt. So that innovative approach was absolutely developed in conjunction between Aberdeen City um, and Aberdeenshire and Murray. We used the, the facility that was provided by that assistance hub to make sure that we got fire service leafleting out via food parcels. So we had local delivery firms delivering food to those who are um, vulnerable in the community and we took the opportunity to put good information in those packages in relation to home fire safety and a number of our um, uniformed and non-uniformed personnel actually volunteered um, throughout that entire process either to um, answer phones to uh, coordinate the volunteers who were going out and doing physical work um, or to be one of the volunteers that was going out and doing physical work so again the approach has been taken by the fire service in Aberdeen and the, the, the people in Aberdeen has been first class 
Um, the LRP is still ongoing. We've, although we still have a focus on um, COVID response, we've now got an all risks approach. We're looking at every single civil contingency thing that might um, present a challenge, and that includes the EU exit and responding to major incidents. So during the, the pandemic, we have had some significant incidents, including um, wide area flooding because of the, the severe rain in the late summer last year, and also the Stonehaven Rail incident, which involved a massive response from the area, including every station within Aberdeen City. Um, so a, a, a complete reworking of, of how we work, but not the impact we are having. Um, has, it would be a fair way to say how the, the COVID pandemic has impacted on the fire service. We still are very community focused. We still work exclusively with partners and we still absolutely deliver um, the service that would be expected of us. Behind the scenes, the, the, the public will be unaware of, it's meant a, a complete re-engineering of everything from our receipt of call to how we um, deal with home fire safety visits. Uh, so a, a very challenging 12 months but a lot of those challenges will bring about changes that will carry forward into the future because they have been very well received and are extremely effective. So, can be there. I, I will stop there. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that report. I'm not sure if there's a bit of an echo there, um, uh, Mr. Ferguson. Um, there's a few things that I know that I would sort of pick up on. I was really heartened to hear you say that um, to take a the fire service are taking a kind approach and for officers to know when to take a break because it is very important we're the most resilient person is being tested over this past year and obviously you'll see things that we won't experience so I'm glad to hear that you've said that you have a kind approach I asked the police and I want to ask your your service as well given that you said you have an exemplary uh, attendance how are how are your the fire service i think can be a, the, the um individually the firefighters are, are um our morale tends to be um relatively good um, they've got a good team ethic they work well with each other and, and they support each other but there is an element of fatigue now coming in. Um, we've been 12 months under this very challenging situation. Um, and it's not just at work, it's at home, it's in our social lives, it's in every aspect that, that, that we have in life. Um, so there is that fatigue that we are seeing now and having to, um, to uh, acknowledge and also take action um, on. Um, but in general, um, our firefighters are resilient individuals, as you say, um, that they, they they yeah, very much have a want to get the job done approach and attitude and they, they find ways themselves of um, generating morale. So, for example, at the moment in Aberdeen City, we have a team who are undertaking a, a charity um, event. So they're, they're doing a charity called March the Month, which is for prostate cancer. And they're doing 11,000 steps a day, um, which is quite, it, it, it seems like 11,000 is not too bad. It's um, break it down to five to five and a half miles a day every day um, but that generates a, a, a renewed team spirit um, a, a focus and uh, a lot of good morale comes out of that sort of event as well as well as raising funds for a very worthwhile cause so uh, to answer your question they are doing fine and um, they, they, there are struggles without a doubt and it'd be wrong to say they weren't um, but we are making sure that those who do need help are getting help and by and large morale is very good across the service. Thank you, that is good to hear and I understand the, the whole complexity of the issue when taking it home as well and how we're all coping but that is reassuring so thank you for that and please pass on the good wishes of the committee. We do recognise um, all that the service does to keep us safe. Um, I don't see actually any hands but perhaps Derek can tell me if there's any hands. Yeah up. yes yes convener we seem to be having sticky hand syndrome um, applying at various times. I currently on my screen can see Councillor Allard followed by Councillor Houghton. Okay that's like so I don't have that at all nothing showing um, but uh, anyway Councillor Allard will take you first as we missed you out the last as we had already agreed the item. So please do come in. Yes, thank you very much, Convener. I don't worry about the last item. What I'll do, I'll just send an email to the 
Superintendent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Farkasson, for this fantastic uh, verbal update showing you very much the strength of the uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, and I'm very, very impressed with uh, the way the service has been conducted during the, the pandemic, and particularly on the uh, engagement uh, with the communities and with stakeholders and key partners. And I have to say that um, there's been a lot of approach and Microsoft Teams meetings on deliberate fire in Tory and in the Gramps, and uh, that's been very successful to try to address the issue with Police Scotland. And I really uh, want to uh, acknowledge that and, and, and thank the, the, the personnel to, to, do, to do that very valuable work. On that particular point of deliberate fire, uh, Convener, you did say, uh, uh, you did ask Mr. Farkasson about what he thought about the thematic report and the suggestion that we put forward. And I would like to know, Mr. Farkasson, if it's comfortable for that particular report on the grams to target uh, young people. Uh, I, I, I'm a bit uh, uh, uneasy with it, because if we go back in 2011, I can remember that some of the people who were charged were quite older, they were in the late 20s. So I, I, I would like to know what Mr. Farkasson think about that, and maybe if Convener would, would agree to maybe remove the, the young part of the deliberate fire regarding reports. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Allard. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, we can assume sometimes that young people are the cause of uh, that, particularly um, that sort of fire in that location. Um, the the fires that you mentioned, about Gramps and and, uh, and and Tory, you're right. They were carried out by youths, and the individual um, that was arrested as a result is not a youth. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a, a point that is well made. Um, I'm happy within the report to remove anything that would suggest that it is a, a problem that young people have, um, because that would probably be a, a misrepresentation of the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, councillor, I've got Councillor Houghton. I know that Councillor Tom Mason wanted to ask questions, so if he can't speak, I'm going to, if there's a problem with the technology, then I'll, I'll do it. And then I've got Councillor Townsend after that. So Councillor Houghton. All right, you can do that. I'm very sad to learn that people in late twenties are no longer considered young. But I'll ask. <laughs> um, my question was: I, I was very um, pleased to hear you say we're talking about the mental health of the teams and um, the the ways that you know it, it can sometimes be the small things. You know, just like giving people a bit of time off, a bit of grace, you know, a bit of unexpected time off. Um, from my time in the the military, I knew I know often that that would sometimes be the ambition of the senior ranks and the, and the you know commissioned officers and stuff. But it it, sometimes maybe the, the sort of lower um, lower level down managers and stuff would find it difficult to kind of uphold that that aspiration. So I was just wondering how how do you go about ensuring there's the resource so that your crew managers and stuff can actually give people these, these um, much needed you know little bits of help. Thank you, Councillor Houghton. It's a it's a point that's well observed uh, that the aspiration sometimes doesn't actually meet the the reality. Um, but there are other opportunities that are available to us. Um, so on the fire stations, we, we well understand that if we give a little bit, we get an awful lot more back. Um, and sometimes just giving a little bit can be as simple as um, yeah, rather than working all the way to midnight, we'll, we'll, we'll stop at maybe nine o'clock. Um, at the moment, a great opportunity is the Six Nations Rugby. You know, so so if, if the, uh, the crew or watch commander would decide that you know what, I think we'll just stop at lunchtime today and we'll watch the rugby and um, and just take some time out and relax. Or, or if you want to go, unfortunately our gyms are off limits, but they want to take some of the equipment outside and, and work out in the fresh air. Um, just making those quite small allowances um, has a huge effect. It really it, it helps people just to have a little bit of their own headspace, a little bit of time, um, a little bit to go and do something that maybe is physically and mentally good for them. And even if it was just sitting relaxing for um, 80 minutes, if watching Scotland can be called relaxing, um, it, but just taking that little bit of downtime, um, we absolutely, uh, when I say we, I mean the senior management in the city, we absolutely see the need for that, but also the, the benefit that can be derived from that. So yes, perhaps we can't always give people time off, in inverted commas, 
um, we can give people downtime in the fire stations um, and give them that opportunity to not constantly be watching the clock, not constantly be working to the book uh, and just, like I say, be, being kind to each other and giving each other a little bit of space when necessary. Thank you, Kibir. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good question, actually, and well observed. Um, Councillor Mason, do you want to try and see if your microphone is working? If not, I can ask the question that you wanted to ask. Unfortunately, Councillor Mason, I can't hear you. Um, I believe he's muted, convener. Yeah. Oh, right. OK, Councillor Mason, it looks like you're muted. Convener, if I may, it looks like there is a technical issue with Councillor Mason's device, even okay. when he's on uh, live. OK, so I'm so sorry, Councillor Mason, that we can't hear you, um, but I know that you spoke to me about um, a concern that you had um, regarding whether we should, the, the fire service would want to be notified if people were, uh, let's say, legitimately having bonfires within their own homes or gr uh, grounds. Um, so, Mr. Parkinson, are, are you quite happy for the public to contact you to let you know that they're having maybe a bonfire? I'm not talking about bonfire night, they may be just having some sort of uh, bonfire yeah. in their garden or field or you know those living in the country are you quite happy for that yes thank, thank you Kavina and councillor mason for the the, the question and um, i would say not only i'd be happy for that i would absolutely encourage that um we often see it particularly this time of year and um, with your burn season and um farmers and um, estates burning uh, heather um we see smoke in the hills and we, we really encourage uh, people who are undertaking that activity to let us know. But equally, if um, it's a golf course burning winds, if it's um, somebody burning leaves or burning household waste, um, we absolutely would like to know that that's what's happening and, and it gets recorded in our command and control system as a controlled burn. Um, and and the, it's quite straightforward. You phone our fire control centre, tell them when and where you're having that fire. Um, we'll ask for a contact number and we'll ask you to phone us back when you're finished. And what it prevents is um, a, a well-intentioned 999 call being placed that we will be duty-bound to respond to. Um, so, yeah, I would absolutely encourage if people are going to have a fire in their garden, um, then please let us know and that will prevent you getting um, two fire trucks rolling up outside your door and all the consternation that goes along with that, but also the depletion of resources that goes along with that for the rest of the city. OK, th thank you for providing that that clarity, actually, and thank you for the question, Councillor Mason. I think it's maybe something a lot, a lot of us were, were thinking about. So it's uh, so in other words, yes, let the fire service know in advance um, and it would maybe save them time, money where they could be attending to another fire or rescue. Thank you for that. Councillor Townsend, you have a, a question? Yeah, thank you, Convener. It's to ask a uh, possible positive from the pan pandemic, uh, what's been described, uh, heightened community engagement and raised interest in Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in the, very much in the spotlight. I wondered if there has been an increase in interest, increase in recruitment, or do you envisage perhaps as we go into the future, as we come out of the pandemic, that yeah, recruitment, recruitment levels will, will increase. Um, thank you, Councillor Townsend. Um, we're actually mid-process right now for recruitment. Um, we've taken an approach where we have the recruitment open on three different um, occasions throughout the year now. Um, and we are seeing the same levels um, of interest. Uh, there are a, a number of challenges in, in the recruitment process, so not least of which is the physical need to do a, a medical and a, a practical test. Um, but we have all year round recruitment. We are seeing um, no drop off in enthusiasm for people to want to join the fire service, and which we're very heartened by, to be honest. Um, and we are hopeful that we will continue to see that. And I think opportunities like this to talk about what we have done through coronavirus um, to show people that you know the fire service is a um, an evolving 
service that we are um, absolutely able to move quickly, that we have people at the foremost of our thinking, not just the public, but our own people. All of that adds to the appeal of the fire service as a career. And so we have seen no drop off at all in the process. Thank you. Do you for have another question, Councillor Townsend? One very brief question and another one, convener. Thank you. The use of virtual inspections. Uh, I wondered, you might not be able to make comment on this, but one, would you see that uh, in continuing after the pandemic, maybe increasing, and would there be any uh, wisdom in having covert uh, virtual inspections, if you know what I mean? Because some premises give you one story, but when you actually go there, unannounced uh, story is entirely different. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor. Um, in relation to the first part of that, yes, I do see it continuing. And um, there are um, lots of opportunities where the the time and travel involved in getting to a premise to do an inspection um, is disproportionate. So to carry out a, a virtual inspection um, is preferable, uh, not just for us, but possibly for the uh, premise owner as well. Um, in relation to a covert inspection, um, that's not something we've explored. Uh, we we I understand the comments you're making, and we do often get reports from covert sources that an infringement is in place, and, and we respond um, immediately to that and, and have um, either a, a senior officer or an inspecting officer go down to see if what's been reported is accurate. Um, but our approach is very much to work alongside the, the premise owner to raise awareness, to improve safety, and only if absolutely necessary to bring along any enforcement activity. Um, so I, I would doubt very much whether a covert approach would be something we would take. Um, but if people do tell us about a, a situation that we are unaware of, then we absolutely will respond to that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Do, do we have any other questions? Um, I don't see any hands, but D Derek, do you see we, any? We have no other hands. The only addition we have, convener, is a message in the chat column from Councillor Mason who refers to the linked smoke alarm regulations having been deferred for a further year and asking how is the service involved in progressing the adaption of the public in compliance with these regulations? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the, the question. Um, so we have received a million pounds of funding to buy link detection systems that we will start to install in high risk addresses as soon as we return to normal activity. Um, uh, and I, I wouldn't care to hazard a guess as to when that might be. Um, in relation to the legislative requirement behind it, um, we don't have any legislative imperative in, for domestic premises. Um, that rule sits with the building standards within the local authority. Um, but we obviously are, are a supporter of the approach and will continue to endorse it and to um, and, well, begin to install the link detection systems as soon as we possibly can. Thank, thank you for that. Um, th thank, thank you, Councillor Mason, for, for um, raising that in the chat. I couldn't quite work it out, so thank you, Derek. Um, can I just ask Mr. Parkinson, uh, and if if you haven't got control over um, sort of domestic properties, and it is all the the council, what would then be classified as high risk? Would it would it be high risk domestic properties, or is it all properties? Um, what we do, um, convener, is we risk assess on a home fire safety visit. So we will we'll carry a, a home fire safety visit, and during that, we ask a number of questions allow us to um to classify somebody as being at risk or not and it can the, the, the range of questions is vast it includes um the age of the householder um their mobility if the the, the practices that they employ within their home whether they use candles and um, the ability to cook and um, if they smoke if they drink there's a whole range of questions that we would ask to find out whether that person could be classed as um, high risk or vulnerable to fire. Um, and we use that rating then to decide how much of a priority we see them as and if there's a need to fit that um, system. So if we have 
somebody living in their own home, um, and I stress their own home, not a rented home, um, but their own home without any detection, who is elderly, has mobility issues, and perhaps is a smoker, then they would absolutely be high risk and would receive um, the highest, highest priority. Um, if at the other end of the spectrum, it's a, a young family who don't smoke, don't drink, um, very rarely cook, uh, don't use candles, have got a good electrical safety system in their house, um, then they would, and a, and a detection system installed in their house, then um, we would still have a discussion with them about fire safety, but they would receive less of a priority than uh, the other end of the spectrum. So is this going to be a legal requirement then? Um, it is already a legal requirement. It is, yeah. and how will it be enforced? Because I imagine this is going to be quite difficult for a lot of people, well, because it's not just going to be a few pounds. Uh, the, the cost comes out to be £115-£200 per household um, and uh, the, the enforcement of this, is, that's the $60 million question. Um, the fire service are not the enforcing authority and the, uh, the understanding at the moment is that if and when you come to sell your house and you have a home report carried out, that would be the opportunity for um, the, uh, the work that is required by law to be assessed. So when a home report is carried out, when the house um, goes onto the market for sale, will be when that, that uh, will be identified if it's been done or not been done. I see. OK, well, that, that actually gives a bit of clarity, actually, so that it is when it would be sold. That's interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, that is actually very interesting information. Um, do I have any other questions? Convener, Councillor McGregor's hand is raised. OK. Thanks very much, convener, and thanks, Mr. Farkerson. I It's not really a question. It's just to say I managed to hear an interview on on the wireless, and uh, it was about these shocking fires in the Western Isles in uh, in winter time, which I think surprised everybody. And it was it was the training and be awareness um, message that you managed to get across by saying what you thought the three main causes of fire were, the, the men, the women and the children. But I mean, I think we were all astonished that such a thing could happen. We think of Scotland in the winter time as being cold and wet and that fire is no risk at all, but it shows you it's there everywhere. So thanks very much for that. Thank you, Councillor. And as well as being the local senior officer for Aberdeen, I am also the national lead for wildfire and, uh, and often have the responsibility of the, the joy of speaking on the radio or, uh, or on the television. Um, and quite a surreal experience sitting in my own home doing a live broadcast on BBC Radio Scotland. Um, it, the, the weather conditions, um, although a factor in wildfire, are not the only factor, and it surprises many people that we can have snow on the ground, but fires happening. And in fact, the, the keepers at the moment are using the snow drifts as a good opportunity as a, a fire stop for their controlled burning activity. Um, so yeah, it catches a lot of people out, but it, that is the, the fact of the country we live in. Thank you very much for that. Yes, it's an interesting dimension. So thank you. I didn't, I'm sorry I didn't hear you, but yes, it's a, that's an interesting point. Are there any other questions? No other hands, Convener. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ferguson. Um, I look forward to seeing those thematic reports that have been discussed earlier in liaison with, uh, with Derek and obviously um, any other reports, that, written reports that will come to the next committee. Um, oops, sorry, um, Scott, I don't know. Um, just, is there, have I missed something? No, my, my colleague uh, Scott Simon has, has joined us on the screen, much to his, much to his surprise, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Mine. <laughs> I, just, I just wondered if he was wanting to add something. I take it that's a no. <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Sorry, my uh, laptop battery ran out, so I've been frantically trying to get it charged up again. So when I came in, the, the camera came. Apologies. No, no. This is the this is the wonders of working this way. I wasn't just sure how to react there. I suppose you get a very natural response when we're we're like like this. But anyway, thank you very much, and please again can be our thanks and support to the the, the fire service, and look forward to seeing you if not before, at the next committee in, at the end of April. And the weather just has to have improved, got warmer anyway. So um, all the very best to you.
Thank you very much, Kimbina. Thank you, councillors. Thank you. Okay, so, um, committee, we have uh, now protective services, um, and it's a Ms. Mr. Morrison, and obviously, thank you for your patience in, in sitting there waiting for this. I know it's a verbal update. Um, I'm obviously very conscious of the stresses and strains on the service mm -hmm. and where we're all placed. Um, and obviously, we are, we are living in just extraordinary uh, and exceptional times. But um, obviously, just, and I, I know that you know, uh, but, but a verbal update from one of the council services would be more the exception than, than the rules. So we'll look forward to a written report next time. Um, so, but out with that, would you want to give us your verbal report, please? Okay. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, you Santina. Um, as you know, I, I presented a report to this committee back in October on the work of environmental health and training standards in relation to COVID-19. Uh, and I will be providing a report to the April committee uh, on our work as well. Um, but I'll just give a brief uh, verbal update today in relation to what we've been doing. Um, the officers from both environmental health and training standards continue to operate as a unified, integrated team to deliver the business restrictions and investigation of clusters of cases associated with business premises. Environmental health are frequently referred to in relation to this work, but it is important that we recognise that the vital role of trading standards uh, also involved in this work stream. Uh, nationally, uh, there's been a lot of publicity about environmental health, but very little about trading standards. So it's just important we, we recognise that. Um, throughout this and next week, uh, next month's uh, written reports, when I refer to officers, that, that means environmental health and trading standards. Um, I can confirm, as per Chief Superintendent McDonald's update, that we continue to work closely with our, our colleagues in uh, partners, uh, Police Scotland, the public health team at NHS Grampian, uh, and the health and safety executive in applying the restrictions and also the investigation of cases. The work of the team has continued to be largely focused on COVID-19, but we have also been tackling other priority areas. Uh, for example, investigation of significant complaints, high risk public health issues, product safety complaints, scams, and of course, EU exit. Uh, one issue of note is that Colleagues from our training standards team were involved earlier in the year in a seizure of illicit tobacco using the tobacco detection dog. Um, in the run up to Christmas, uh, our primary focus was in relation to the hospitality and retail sectors, as well as providing the support and advice in relation to, to Christmas related events. Unfortunately, a lot of those didn't manage to go ahead because the controls were tighter than, than anticipated. Back in November, officers served directions under the regulations in relation to four business premises following breaches of the requirements during the screening of the Scotland-Serbia football match. Um, since Christmas and the move to the level four restrictions and the, the consequent closure of a large proportion of the businesses, the proactive work has focused largely on food retail, uh, supermarkets to a large extent, uh, and also the takeaway sector to make sure appropriate controls are in place there. Um, but additionally, we've had lots of requests for advice uh, and complaints about, about business practices, and they've become a lot more nuanced in terms of what exactly is permitted or not permitted under the regulations. Uh, earlier in, in the pandemic, um, businesses went along with the general guidance, um, trying to follow the right thing. Now, in terms of business survival, it's very much what do the regulations require me to not do or what can I get away with doing? Um, so, so that has become a very, very nuanced issue and, and quite a, a difficult line to walk. Um, back in February, um, officers, along with colleagues from Police Scotland, investigated complaints regarding a visiting football team who attended a restaurant in Aberdeen in breach of the requirements. Um, the investigations identified that it wasn't a willful breach uh, the, and that the club had been given some erroneous advice. Um, we ensured that they were given the correct advice to ensure that in future there will be no repeat recurrences. We, along with our colleagues in the police, continue to operate a four E's approach, uh, only resorting to formal enforcement 
uh, where other measures have been unsuccessful in achieving the desired ends. Um, and that can be seen by the fact that other than the four directions I mentioned earlier, we have only served one prohibition notice in relation to a, a nail bar who continue trading when they're required to be closed. We also have one of the three hotels for managed isolation of international travellers, travellers, uh, and we've been working closely with the, the hotel and the security team to ensure that appropriate controls are in place to prevent the importation of cases of, of COVID and potentially new variants. As well as responding locally, um, officers have been providing national leadership in relation to, to COVID and business restrictions. We're, we're heavily represented in, in national forums, including the expert group that provides consistency uh, in enforcement of these issues across Scotland, and also participate in multiple forums with, with Scottish Government, Public Health Scotland, etc., to, to provide uh, advice uh, and opinion to help to help develop Scottish Government policy uh, and the guidance itself to ensure we have guidance uh, and legislation that is enforceable. Um, we're currently working on the preparations for reopening of businesses over the coming months uh, and anticipating uh, a busy year for domestic tourism coming up. Um, so there's likely to be uh, a lot of work involved there. And we'll also be supporting whatever events are permitted as, as restrictions are, are eased. Uh, we will also work, of course, with colleagues in relation to ensuring that we have a, a, a safe election, uh, both in terms of polling stations and the count, um, as well as preparing for the resumption of, of normal enforcement activity and the return to normal. Um, a number of our activities have either been suspended or, or reduced during the pandemic. Um, for example, we have not been able to undertake any visits for uh, test purchasing of age restricted products such as tobacco. There is no safe means in the pandemic to, to put a child in that environment. Um, also, we, we only visit into domestic premises where there is a, a, a significant public health need and that that need outweighs any, any risk associated. And of course, routine food inspections have been suspended. Uh, ministers have given a derogation from the food law code of practice um, but as that runs out later in the year, we'll be recommencing those food visits and then balancing that work alongside the work to, to carry on with uh, the restrictions that may still, still exist. As, as we go back to normality, um, we won't be going back to the way we've done things in the past. We will be learning the lessons from, from COVID uh, and the things that we have learned and, and taken on board. So we will be absorbing some of these things and and like the colleagues in the fire authority you know we will be using uh, digital tools to assist us where where virtual inspection particularly in relation to to revisits uh, and the like can can be used uh, and also i think and and to a degree unfortunately uh, an element of homeworking i think is going to be the new normal um the team are very keen to get back in the office and see colleagues and, and have that interaction um and so, so hopefully in the near future, we'll have an element of that, but we will never move away from an element of homework and going forward. Uh, just a, a whistle top store of what we've been doing in relation to COVID. And I say more detail will be provided next month in the in the written report. Uh, but but thank you, Kavina, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank you. For the, we've got an echo. Maybe if you put yours off and then put it on when the questions and I'll do mine as well. Well, thank you very much for that um, and give some assurances. I can see how the service has been very um, full and occupied during this this, the, this time. Um, just want to ask if there are any questions from any committee members. Um, At this time, convener, there are no hands. Oh, sorry, Councillor Townsend has just put his hand up. <laughs> Mr. Townsend, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to ask the question. Uh, this is being quite respectful. Uh, from what you said, you appear to have very much moved to re reactive as opposed to proactive for what you said has, has to be uh, abandoned at the moment. I wondered, uh, in the reactive, uh, if you're called in by uh, Police Scotland to, to anything, 
uh, how well received uh, are you by the, the subject of the, the call, if you, not the police, but by the subject of the call, uh, your expertise, can that often uh, assist the police to dilute matters, if you like? Um, yes, potentially. We, we work closely with, with Police Scotland, but we do have a, a sort of distinct separation. So, <laughs> so we deal with the business issues, uh, whereas the police primarily focus on individual, uh, the general public. Uh, so, so if we had an issue within a store of, of, of contraventions there, we would be dealing with the store. Police Scotland would deal with the individuals. So, so we work we work well together in that partnership. Uh, for example, the the the, um, the one I mentioned earlier about the visiting football team, that was a joint visit from Police Scotland and, and one of my officers uh, who who worked hand in glove together. Uh, and ensured that there was no no doubt of, of how we were taking a, a joined up approach to it. Um, what I would say is from the vast majority of businesses, we've had nothing but cooperation. Um, businesses have been doing their utmost to do the right thing. And the issues have been about where that line in the sand actually is drawn. I could have a follow up question to that. Can you know, is, uh, in regard to licensed premises, do you find any difference between uh, the owner of the premises actually being op operating the premises or somebody else uh, leasing it? Is, is there any uh, difference in, in the reaction that you get to your requirements? We haven't noted any difference. Um, and I say across the, the, the license trade, um, the, the compliance levels have been very good across the board. We had, as I say, four directions served in November uh, on, on the licence trade, but they were very specific circumstances uh, regarding that football match. Other than that, the, there has been very, very limited uh, non-compliance from, from any any premises. Thank you, Kavira. Thank you. Thank you. Would, is there any other thing that you would like to add? Uh, you know, I've asked the police and I've asked the fire service, uh, fire and rescue service, you know, how they're all sort of coping um, how is your service coping? Yeah. Uh, similarly, there's there's uh, there's fatigue drawing in. This has been a longer period of of, of this work than we anticipated, um, and of course, a lot of the work of the officers at the moment has quite a negative connotation. We're telling businesses they can't do this and they must stay closed, uh, and we're dealing with people who you know are facing f significant financial difficulty. Um, so it is a very hard message to be giving day in, day out. Um, so, so that is difficult. Um, officers also, like everyone else, um, struggle with an element of the homeworking and that lack of, of, of human contact. Um, but, but we're bearing up um, and we're doing likewise to, to try and support the team by being making adjustments where we can uh, and being as supportive as, as possible. Well, thank you for being honest. Um, you know, it's, I think everyone is actually caring, but it's good to know that we're all just sort of keeping going and the services are actually functioning, which obviously is a very important part, particularly as we move slowly out of lockdown and see the shops reopening. Um, I can see how some of the cafes are o operating. Um, maybe there's a bit of leniency with some, I would say, in my observations. But anyway, thank you for that. Um, are there any other questions for any of the other members? Councillor McGregor has his hand raised, convener. Councillor McGregor. Hello, Councillor McGregor. Oh, hello, convener. Thanks very much for your indulgence. It was just to say to Mr Morrison, the feedback I've had that the teams you lead, are the, the work has been thoroughly professional and, uh, and helpful. So it was just to say thanks on behalf of the people we represent. Thank you. Great. Th thank you very much for that, Councillor. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, for adding that in, Councillor McGregor. Uh, it's funny, but I always remember someone saying to me, um, you remember those that didn't thank you rather than those that did. But I think it is important to thank a service for what they are doing, because there's many people that are just trying to operate as, as your services and keep things going in these very difficult times. So. Um, I would add to Councillor McGregor, but thank you. Thank you, Kavina. Right. Okay, so I think I think that is us actually done. Unless there's any other questions.
Um, Derek? Uh, there is nothing else showing convener, and as you have said, that is our last agenda item. OK, so what I would say is thank you very much for everybody participating. Given that it wasn't a heavy agenda, I have to say, I think it's been a very thorough and robust uh, discussion of all the reports and I thank you for all the, the contributions. Um, I think it actually reflects that we do show good governance in this committee and thoroughly um, ask uh, questions of what's put in front of us. So I thank you for that. Um, we need to know that we're still doing as good a job as we can do, and I think we are, given it's, it's all done, being done remotely. So thank you to officers um, and, and all those who have participated in today's meeting, and I look forward to seeing you um, at the meeting, um, the next public protection meeting, which is the 28th of April, and I'm sure it's going to be a lot warmer. The sun will shine. The sun, the sun will shine. So take care, everyone, and um, we'll catch up with you all soon. Bye, just now. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Convener. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.